Hi everyone, this is Tina Schmidt. Welcome back to my channel, Kingdom Walker 24-7, where we learn, become edified, and we glorify uh, Jesus and the Father God in the Kingdom of Heaven, and we stay inspired. Well, this is part three in uh, the series on visions, visions and dreams. And so we're going to jump right in. If you remember in our last uh, episode, I talked about how Peter had um, had a vision. Uh, he thought he was having a vision, and he and the apostles were let out um, of prison. The chains fell off. They were let out of prison by an angel and found themselves uh, free, uh, which they first thought was a vision. And then also we talked about Elisha giving his servant an open vision to encourage his faith when he could see the armies of angels coming to their aid just before a war started. And then we talked about Stephen, or Stephen, Stephen's open vision before he was stoned. As they were stoning him, he, he looked up and he saw the kingdom of heaven open. He saw Jesus at the right hand of God. And um, he asked the Lord to receive him, and the Lord did. Nobody else could see that vision. And we also talked about Ezekiel who was able to step into his vision and enter into Zion and measure the city. And then we also talked about John, who had his visitation uh, into the kingdom of heaven, where he saw all these amazing visions. But one thing that's very interesting uh, that we talked about, too, was uh, the subtle differences between dream, a dream state in which the Lord is working with your mind, uh, and then as you move into the vision state, he starts working with your soul and your spirit. And sometimes when he's working with your whole being, he can pull you up into uh, his world, which we saw happen with uh, some of the prophets uh, that we talked about last time. So now I'm going to continue. I left you off with uh, Paul giving his vision, his perception he was trying to pull it all together for uh, the people to understand what it was that he saw. He was giving them a vision of perception from his perception. So now let's look at this reminder that he gives, this instruction. Uh, you know, he had this experience seeing Jesus, and he had other experiences. And he also uh, had gone to heaven and returned to talk about it. And so he has... He has something he's trying to get out to tell people. And he's trying to form it in a way that they can, they can understand. Listen to this. In Colossians 3.1, he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Okay. Verse 2, set your mind on things above, not earthly things. And then verse 3, this is very key, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Your life is now in Christ. And I explained before that uh, I had a supernatural experience when the Lord had me move in his spirit and then back out. And I moved back into his spirit and then back out. And every time I entered into the Lord, the whole perception of my reality changed. He opened himself up and I was sheltered inside the Christ who was inside the Father. And I was there in unity. And then I moved out my 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 awareness and I was back in the Adamic paradigm and I went oh wow and moved back in so he allowed this to happen through my what I call my 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 three days he did this for three days this was like being three days in the grave and he had me move in and out so I could be aware of the perception the change in my paradigm my awareness when I was in his spirit Everything was fine. Even if my body was hurting, I was in, everything was okay. It was all going to be okay. And then the pain would leave. 
right? And then I come back. Oh, everything comes back. Click, click, click. I'm back here again. And then I would go back into his spirit and everything was perfect. And then back out. And this happened, I would say I would, this shift in awareness happened as he was opening his spirit, having me move into him and back out. This happened like maybe five or six times. Um, and then the next day it happened again, and the next day it happened again. So for three days at least this happened. And finally I said, Lord, I choose. I'm staying in you. I do believe because Paul had supernatural experiences with the Lord, he totally got this. This is what he says when we die to this world and we live in the spirit of Christ. This is so good. I'm going to read it again, Colossians 3, 1, because it's worth it again. Okay. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. So you're, you're dead to this world and you're raised with Christ. You set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Hidden. Hidden where the enemy can't find you. Hidden in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life. You remember Paul also said, it's not me speaking anymore. It's Christ living in me. That's the identity transformation he finally got and understood. You see? And too many times, what we're trying to do is live our worldly lives down here in the trenches. And we're trying to drag Jesus down here with us and ask him to help us and ask him to do this and that for us. But we haven't stepped up to where he's calling us. When John stepped into heaven from his vision, he said, come up here. And he said, he went up in spirit. Same thing happened with Ezekiel. Come up here. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven, what was he saying? He was giving us the kingdom of heaven. He was bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth through him. And now we follow him up into the kingdom in our daily life. And people don't get it. They end, they go, they go to the, the church on Sunday, they do their secular religious thing. And I'm not saying it's you. You wouldn't be watching this if that was, was you. And you're, you're reaching outside the box. But there's a lot who will just do the routine and they come home and they're still here. They haven't followed Jesus into the kingdom to live a glorious life with him. Okay. Remember last, in the last episode, I talked about Jesus being our inheritance. Okay. Uh, when he died, we inherited the kingdom of heaven. But he was also the son of man. So when he died, we inherited heaven and God inherited us. Okay. So because he was part God and he was also man, we got each other's inheritance. God inherits us and we inherit him in the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus gave us through his blood. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. He's saying in Christ, in God, not near God, not observing God from a distance, not far away from God, but in Christ, in God. That is a whole other perspective. And this is the vision that Paul has for us. It's what Jesus gave him in his walk with the Lord. And this is a perception. This is a visual perception he is trying to, to give us here. So I stress this because too many times we still operate, people are still operating out here in their flesh and they're not moving into the reality of these visions that are given to us, all right? It's very important that we understand to move into these realities, to have the inner screen, the inner vision on our inner screen that God gives us, to envision these things, all right? It's very, that's what our imagination is for. Let's look at 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. 
The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. All right. That is amazing. He says, see what great love. See with your vision. Can you envision this? See what great love the Father has lavished on us. What's the vision here in your inner screen that God gave you? What is that vision? What does it look like when he says, see? See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Do you see the Father loving you? Loving you, putting his arms around you? Do you see the Father radiating his glory in every breath he takes so you can live? Do you see him pulsing with love out to you unconditionally? This is the vision that's been given to us. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Not will be, not something far away, but what we are. And children of God. How do we become children of God? His spirit is seated in us. Then the old self dies. And what takes the place of the old carnal identity and soul? It's gone. The Holy Spirit grows in you, and you become a new being never before. Okay, And this is fascinating, because this is the mergence. This is what merges the marriage. This is what merges your soul, your spirit, your entire being with Christ. And you become a son or a daughter of God. This is not something just uttered out of the mouth in ignorance. There is a vision here he is trying to give you, a reality that he wants us to move into. Okay? And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. There's a lot of people who have felt out of place on this planet all of their life. They have felt like they're an oddball. They have felt they, they can't relate because people seem superficial. They hunger and thirst for something deeper. They feel like there's a vacancy in their soul, an angst. They're yearning for an ache. Nothing can fill. They get robbed of the vitality of their life because they can't fill it. They don't know what it is. You know what it is? It's that place that you fill in the heart of God. He has a place reserved just for you just for you in his kingdom, predestined. And if you don't follow it there, you won't know what's missing in you. And this is, this is a truth, an undeniable truth. Ephesians 1.4, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, verse 5, he predestined us for the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good purpose and pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, this is interesting. How many times does he talk about in love in him? God chose us in Christ in Christ. This isn't just a figure of speech. He chose us inside, to be inside the Christ spirit, to live our reality from within the spirit of Christ. Not just a, a euphemistic or, you know, kind of an ideal. You can actually live inside the spirit of the Christ. And Jesus showed me something. I learned something amazing about being inside that spirit of his. Okay, and he will open up intimacy to you. He will start telling you and teaching you about him in the most amazing ways if you dwell in his spirit. This is so important. It says, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That means you were handpicked to be his. All right. That we should be holy and blameless before him. So that means you have a lot of work to do to um, meet up 
with that plan of his, if you're not stepping into the spirit now, he wants you to be holy and sanctified. And a lot of people live corrupted lives, even as Christians, and they don't get this thing about holiness. They don't want to do it. They're lazy about it. It's like, well, he loves me. I'm saved. Is that not what you hear sometimes? Oh, yeah, well, nobody can be holy. Nobody can do that. No, that's where he wants us. He wants us in his spirit. Because to be in his spirit, we have to step up to that responsibility. Because he is holy. That's why he says, be holy, for I am holy. The Lord says that. He wants us to be holy for him. He loves you that much. Okay? And so this is a this is amazing. This insight, this perception a, a vision perception that Paul is giving. He predestined us for adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. God wants you as a son or a daughter, adopting you by Jesus, through Jesus, according to the good purpose and pleasure of his will. Why through Jesus? Because Jesus was God who came down to be a man. He qualified for the, as the perfect man, therefore freeing the spirit of God to move through him upon this earth and into you, that Holy Spirit. And that's what takes over and brings you back into the kingdom. Verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The beloved is Jesus. He has blessed us in the spirit of the Christ. That's where we keep our blessing. That's where we are safe. And no one can snatch us out of, out of the hand of God. Okay? So in the beloved means inside the spirit of Christ and becoming his body. We are the, the body, right? We're the body of Christ. We are his spirit on the earth. I'm trying to help people understanding and really get this on a deep level. It's not just, we tend to say things and not really embrace the true spirit meaning of these things, which I think the apostles tried so very hard to give us in truth. Ephesians 1, 7 through 12. Paul is able to see with perception into the plan of God. Okay, Listen to his plan. He, he sees God's plan. This is the perception by his inner vision that he's trying to give us. Okay. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself. Okay. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Do you see this plan? This is an amazing thing, to capture all things in heaven and earth in him. Let's go on to verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. I think that's amazing to the praise of his glory. All of this is about his glory. Now, people say they don't know what the will of God is. It's right here. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. What is God's will? Right here. Okay. That he would, it says here, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, in other words, over time, he might gather together that is, gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. God is gathering all things on him, in heaven and earth, bringing them together. This is the mystery, okay? The mystery of his will is to bring all life back to him back to him, okay, and come together in one, 
okay, to bring things all together in one, all things in Christ. In who? In Christ as one. Both which are in heaven which, and which are on earth in him. You see what's happening? Life. He wants to bring life back. All on earth and all in heaven. And it says also, if you read in the scriptures, that he came to save all creation, not just mankind. And that's something that people often miss. So in him, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. This is an amazing vision. Paul saw God's plan. People go, oh, you can't know God's plan. People will tell you that. Paul saw the plan. He saw it from a <clears throat> macro view. He could see the wheels turning. What this, what this thing, what was going on? How could he see that? Because he shared, his self, he shared the spirit of Christ. He was living inside the spirit of Christ. And Christ gave this to him by revelation. They shared it together. And now Paul is trying to bring it out. He has a perception, a vision perception to give you. But people, they don't get this. They don't envision it. It's just words. And they don't absorb and understand the whole picture, what's going on, which is what I'm really trying to convey to you right now. I'm going to condense it. One, fundamental truth and foundation is forgiveness of sins and redemption through the blood of Jesus. Number two, it's by his grace, by his wisdom and prudence that abounds to us. Number three, it's the rich gift of God's grace that makes known to us the mystery of his will. He's doing this out of grace. Number four, to gather together all things that are in heaven and earth, together in Christ, in his spirit, into him, which is inside his own spirit. Okay. And then five. This is all a plan for our destiny. It was determined before it was unfolded. Number six, so that he who works all things for his purpose should reveal his glory through us who first trusted in Christ Jesus. That's what that means. When you break down that, that, um, those verses that Paul was trying to tell us, that's, that's the significance we can draw out of that. So let's now um, go into how to receive visions and dreams. We're going to switch gears a little bit, okay? And um, we're going to talk a little bit about this. I think it's important. Um, you, you know the scriptures, but then you also uh, learn how to apply uh, some of these things, okay? So let's look. First of all, we have to understand, number one, visions and dreams and the perception of these things all come by the pure grace of God and not by any other way. Your salvation is by grace. Forgiveness of sins is by grace. Visions are dream. Visions and dreams are by his grace. We're not going to come up with some magic technique that works. Okay. It's a relationship he wants. And if he grants visions and dreams, it's by his grace. And it's not because you pulled certain levels or blew certain hoots and whistles for him to react. All right. This is, a, this is an error I see in the Christian church where they're looking for the next big thing, the next little lever they can pull, the next little button they can push on God to get God to react a certain way, to, to maybe... Um, do this and do that, go through A, B, C, D, E, and whatever, trying to get God to respond somewhere. And we miss the fact that it's by grace. It's by his grace and his love for you and your love for him. And that's the bottom line. By grace of God and not by any other way, without grace attempts fail, therefore, Ask and inquire humbly with a heart full of God for God. Get your heart full of God's will. Okay? He loves you. Receive that love. Understand the relationship. You love him, he loves you. 
by grace. The visions and dreams come as you get close to him and inquire with humbleness. Number two, set time aside and turn off all distractions of this busy world. We talked about that in episode one. And number three, ask rightly. Okay. The Lord says in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Did you hear that? Do you know that there are contingencies in this? Okay. Contingents. That means the, the contingencies means there are conditions. If. All right. One, abide in him. In his spirit, not your spirit. Not in your spirit. You abide in his spirit. Abide in his spirit. And two, it's his words, not your words, that you must abide in. Look at it again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So... It's interesting, we need to abide in him, not in ourselves, asking him to do something for us. We need to move from this reality of the paradigm, the Adamic paradigm, we need to move into his spirit, into this holy Jesus, this holy being. We move by grace and a gift, the Holy Spirit. As adopted sons and daughters, we move into the Spirit. Okay. We move into Him. If you abide in me. Now, what else is there? And my words abide in you. Not your words. Not the words that complain and gripe and moan. What are His words? Wasn't He always blessing and helping? He was always blessing. And he had his mind with the Father. Okay. This is amazing. His words will abide in you. You know, when you start walking with the Lord, there will be times you get tempted to acknowledge a negativity, something going on. Well, I have found that uh, if I do that, my whole spirit can feel it. And it's not the way God sees things. Okay, so... Let's say something negative happens uh, and and someone is complaining about it. Uh, what happens if I fall into agreement with that? I can feel that in my, in my spirit. I can feel the heaviness of that. Do you know what I do? I say, you know, God can turn this around. Can't you, Father? Can't you, Lord? There isn't anything you can't do. I keep my eyes on the Lord. And people will send me emails for prayer, and that's wonderful. And then I offer them up to the Lord, and I say, Lord, you are amazingly magnificent. I know that you can take care of these things. I know every prayer in here, Lord, you see, and you know, you know the heaviness in their heart. And by your grace, you are so good, Lord. You are so kind and compassionate. You feel every pain that they suffer. And I know that you hear their prayer. And, and so this is how my conversation with the Lord goes. And so I, I look at it from the kingdom perspective that he can do all things. And uh, I've had some people uh, talk about something uh, suddenly and uh, something bad happened. And I, on that spot, this happened to a neighbor. She told me about um, something bad happened in a diagnosis with her husband. And I just prayed it away and it went away. I just said, Lord, I know you can take care of this. Nothing's too hard. And uh, the very next day, she told me it was gone. And so, so this is how, you know, the Lord hears our prayer. If we're in his spirit and we abide in him and we, we his words abide in us, how these wonderful things can happen. He can, he can do all kinds of wonderful things that uh, when, when, when we're moving in his spirit. Another tip I'm going to give you, and I'll repeat it later, is that you need to ask one thing at a time. If you want God to give you a vision or a dream or get an answer from him, don't pile him with 15 things, okay? Because you will get confused by the answer. One thing at a time. 
All right. This is how what's called waiting on the Lord. So you ask him a question about something. And then you wait. And again, if you don't have that answer, you ask again. But I think that he answers. We're just not willing to look at the answers. Sometimes he answers in a way we don't want to hear. Or sometimes he doesn't want our mind on that thing. Okay? We have to just trust him. So he'll give you the insight you need if you need to pray about it again or if you know what's in his hands. Sometimes there's been times I felt like a wall has come. This is a long time ago when I was still in my early walk with the Lord. I would pray and I'd feel like this wall was there. And I didn't need to shout any louder or, you know, go any, uh, keep yanking on the prayer arm of the Lord for him to hear me. I said, uh, there's something wrong here. And it's my fault, not your fault, Lord. So help me backtrack and find out what this is. And so it required me to slow down, back off, be humble. Like I mentioned in my um, series on spiritual warfare, sometimes you have to just back off and take a breather, quiet everything down and find out if you've made the error or if you're going in a direction he doesn't want. Or if there's some something under the surface that you haven't surrendered over to him and there's an embitterment in your soul or an anger or a frustration or something you haven't put right. You know, you don't have all your ducks in a row, so to speak, with him. When you handle that, then you have breakthrough. So these are things that you learn in your relationship with the Lord. And it's very important that uh, if you're praying for visions and dreams, that like I said in the first episode, that you clear the clutter out. You have to kind of get all the junk out. In episode two, I talked about keeping your inner screen clean and your heart conditioned in a way to be receptive for what he has for you. Now, we're going to do a transition here. And we're going to talk a little bit about Daniel. Now, Daniel was a visionary. A, he was employed by the king. Okay, entrusted by the king as a wise man. And I'm not going to talk about him in the lion's den. I'm going to talk about his visions. This is very important. So the book of Daniel is one of the most richest books uh, in the supernatural regarding dreams and visions. And Daniel was a lot like Isaiah and Ezekiel as he had concerns for the future. He worked with uh, the kings. And uh, he also foretold Jesus Christ. And uh, he saw that Jesus was the sanctuary, that God gives visions and dreams as warnings and guidance and to answer questions for us. And he understood this relationship. Daniel sees Jesus. This is long before Jesus came to earth as Jesus, the name we know as Jesus. He saw the anointed one. Okay. He sees, we're going to call him Jesus. This is the anointed one before he was born. Okay. Presented before God the Father in the heavenly timeline when all the kingdoms of the world are handed over to him. So Daniel now is seeing a vision from the in the future, in our earthly future timeline. How could he see that? Because as I mentioned before, in the kingdom of heaven, God's timeline is different. God has everything going in the eternal now. He knows everything in the past and everything in the present and in the future because God is omnipotent and in his perspective, he sees everything in the now. Okay. Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Daniel gets a peek of this timeline here. Okay. He says, I saw in the night visions and behold, there came one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So now the Son is coming to the Lord, the Ancient of Days, to Father God. Verse 14. Then to him, okay, talking about the Son of Man, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion 
which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, you heard the words. Did you see it in your inner vision? Did you see the glory of Christ in your inner screen? Or was it just words to you? Can you see Jesus, the King of glory, receiving, as I mentioned earlier, all things gathered and collected from heaven and earth, all gathered unto himself? That's what it says. This is Daniel's night vision. He's seeing this. Okay? It's a vision that appeared to him. It was going to happen, you know, hundreds of years later. And he saw it. Daniel had the gifting by the Holy Spirit of God to interpret dreams and visions of others. Some people will say, Oh, you can't, you can have visions and dreams, but you can't also interpret them. You need someone else to do that. And that's not true. When you walk with the Lord, he'll give you the dream and the interpretation. Daniel chapter 2, the whole chapter, so one through verse 1 through 45, um, he's interpreting uh, a dream here. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him greatly. He gathered his magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers, and Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. Nebuchadnezzar was a ruthless guy. He, was, uh, he commanded that they not only interpret the dream, but also to tell him what he had dreamed. They explained to him it was impossible to know the dream except for him, and he didn't trust their answers in the past because of their trickery. So, if they didn't know the dream and interpret it, then they would be killed. That's how things were done back then. They didn't know the dream, so he ordered their execution. He ordered the execution of the magicians, the sorcerers, the astrologers, and the Chaldean wise men. And that would have even included Daniel. But uh, by the grace of God, Daniel was able to tell the king his dream. And this was about that statue. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this giant statue. That's in chapter 2. And in verse from uh, chapter 2, verse 32 and onward, it describes the large statue. And you're familiar with it, I'm sure. It was the head of a, had a head of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze. And in uh, verse 33, its legs of iron, its feet made of iron and clay. And then the, a stone was hurled at it, a large stone uncut by human hands. Okay. And the statue was completely destroyed. And the stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So now Daniel not only tells the dream, but interprets it for the king. So the head of gold. Now he told the king that these were that the head of gold is you, the king of Babylon. That is your kingdom. And then he went on to explain these different metals, the different part of these future kingdoms. And this is what it came out to be. So the head of gold was, was Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, that was going to be his kingdom. The chest and arms of silver became uh, actually became the Persian uh, Macedonian Empire. That came right after. In fact, after Nebuchadnezzar died and his son, Belshazzar, his son was taken over and his son was killed. And Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall for that. So here Daniel is explaining to the king the rise and fall of these future kingdoms. Okay, the, uh, the chest and arms of silver, the Persian Macedonian, it became the Persian Macedonian Empire. The belly and thighs of bronze, we know to be the Greek Empire that rose and fell. And then the legs of iron was the Roman Empire. And the feet of iron and clay is our modern world with a mix of superpowers and nations. The European nation, but also the USA and others. This is um, where we are today. The feet, we're at the very bottom of that statue. Now, what's interesting too is you have to understand why metal? Why is he doing this? Why, why did this dream come to this king in metals? Because metal was so critically important back then. It is now. We are living in an age 
of metal. Do you know what the clay is? We are living in an age of iron and clay. The clay is silicone. Silicone comes from the earth, the dirt of the earth. We're in the last days. The age of silver was the Persian Macedonian Empire. After the, the wealth of the Babylonian Empire came the Persian Empire, silver. That was the metal of trade. That was the metal that uh, everybody used. It was, it was easier to get. It wasn't as strong as, as, as the gold, but it was more prevalent. And then came bronze, the bronze weapons, the spearheads. Bronze was the big thing. And then steel, the iron. The Romans were the ones that invented the how to use this iron to extract it, to make strong swords that didn't break. They also shoed their horses. The Romans were the first ones to put shoes on horses. What were the horses? That was the warfare machine back then. And these horses could travel long and far. They learned how to do this. So we look at this and we look all the way through, you know, the, the medieval times when they fought with swords and they wore iron clad uh, out mesh and shields. We went into that Iron Age. Now we're at the feet of the statue. We have the iron that we're using. We drive these cars. We're using plastics that are pulled up from the earth and silicone. We are in the feet, the bottom of the feet of this big statue. And Daniel had this dream. And, and has it came true. Every bit of that dream came true. He tells Nebuchadnezzar the future history. So the future, which will be a history, he tells Nebuchadnezzar about it. And the king believed him. The king was stunned at, that, at this. And it was relevant to that king and his world and related to him. It was a vision that the king would understand because it was a vision of kingship, of rulership, ruling over nations. And this is how God will talk to you in visions and dreams. He will talk to you by what is relevant to you. Jesus, when he walked the earth, he talked about things relevant to the culture of the time that he was in. All right. Daniel also interprets another dream for the king. This is in chapter four. Nebuchadnezzar gives his own account of the dream and Daniel interprets it correctly. That's in force uh, 10 through 27. Now in this dream, the king, uh, uh, had a dream that there was a tree and it was full and magnificent. It was a very big tree. Its leaves and fruits and had uh, strength were amazing. Okay. The king says he saw a holy one come down from heaven and chop the tree to its root. Now, he was puzzled by this and Daniel explains it. He warns that the king will be driven insane and live like an animal for seven years unless he changed his ways and became compassionate and merciful to the poor. Daniel also advises in uh, chapter four or in verse 27 to the king, he advises him, break off your sins by being righteous and break off your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. So king is going to fall if he doesn't change his ways. He doesn't change his ways. All right, and Daniel gives this warning. He interprets the dream, but there's a warning that goes with it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar ignored the warning. Now, this Nebuchadnezzar king is slow to, to uh, learn. Okay, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were uh, saved out of the fire. Daniel is saved out of the lion's den. The king has had his dream interpreted. He doesn't quite get it. He's like amused by it, perhaps, but not taking it to heart. And what happened was he was given 12 months to respond positively, to respond to the warning, and he didn't. And one day he's out there and he's talking about how great he is and how he built this kingdom from himself. And at that moment, even after 12 months of a grace period from God, he, he actually said the wrong thing. Instead of turning to God, which he had seen many demonstrations of God in his life, uh, which is recorded through what I just mentioned. Um, he just praised himself. And at that moment, he was struck. He was struck with an illness 
and was driven from the men of the king of uh, his kingdom. And from his kingdom, uh, he ended up living like an animal. He was driven out to the outside where he ate grass. And like the animals, he slept on the grass. The dew would collect on his body in the mornings. His hair became long and his nails were long like claws. And he lived like an animal. Seven years. He was like this for seven years. Can you imagine a kingdom being run by someone who's groveling on the ground, eating grass like a, a cow and sleeping in the grass where the dew collects on his body, never cutting his hair? He's gone mad. Um, <laughs> I've heard that. Some of you are making jokes about the politicians, aren't you? <laughs> oh, naughty, naughty. Okay, so after seven years was up, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and his understanding returned to him and he blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. So he had a pretty hard lesson to learn in Daniel 4, 34 through 36, where you can see the whole recording of his hard lesson to learn in those seven years. His sanity was restored and he became humble and honored and praised and extolled the King of Heaven. It says his testimony, his whole testimony is actually in chapter four. And what happened after that? After Nebuchadnezzar came out of that, things started to open up to him and he became one of the wisest people. And he, uh, people would come all over, from all over, all the other kings to hear his wisdom. Why? Because he needed to be broken in order for God to give him what he wanted to give him. And that is a wisdom and understanding of who God is. And when Nebuchadnezzar was broken, he began to understand who was really in charge, and it changed his life. And after that, he became humble, and people came from all over to hear his wisdom. We're going to look at Daniel. One more thing. Hopefully, if we've still got some time left. Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall. And this is uh, uh, from Nebuchadnezzar's son after Nebuchadnezzar died. The son took over. And the son decided to have this big party with a thousand delegates, a thousand lords from other places. And he decides to take out the treasury of the vessels from the temple that were stolen when, when Nebuchadnezzar invaded and took Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar had hidden these holy things. Okay, Now the son, having this big party, decides to break out those those. Uh, those precious precious treasures that were the Lord's, okay? And as he's doing this, he's partying around and starts to uh, honor the gods of silver and gold instead of honoring God in those vessels. And suddenly, so he saw what appeared to be written by a hand on the plaster wall of the king's palace. Um uh, the only one who could interpret that writing, though, was Daniel. So the king looks at it. He's terrified. People are, are seeing it, and they don't know what it means. So they call for Daniel, and Daniel reads it. And it says, Many, many tekel of farsen. Daniel revealed its meaning. Many, M-E-N-E, -E, many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. In other words, there's a deficit. You, the balances have been weighed and there's a lack here. You have been found wanting. Okay. Paris, which is Umfarsen. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now that's in Daniel 5, 26 through 30. So this is the demise of Nebuchadnezzar's son. That night the king was slain by Darius the Mede who took over Babylon. That's how quick it happened. Okay, no warnings this time. He had, he had done the abomination and the lack of respect by uh, giving credit to his gods uh, for the silver and gold, the gods of, his, of silver and gold instead of the god who these vessels were made for. Now, Daniel was empowered by God that Daniel has the spirit of the holy God in him. 
Nebuchadnezzar's own words and his own testimony says this in the ch in chapter 4. Those are Nebuchadnezzar's testimonies. Nebuchadnezzar says, I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you. He mentions it again. He says it in Daniel 4, 9. And the spirit of the holy God is in you. He says it in Daniel 4, 18. So this is amazing that the king recognized that the spirit of the living God was in Daniel. And people will say, oh, no, you can't have that Holy Spirit in you until after Jesus died. And I'm saying to you, God can do whatever he wants by his grace. And if Nebuchadnezzar recognized that God was in Daniel, we need to pay attention to that. Everything is inspired by God. Every word is inspired by God. We have to understand this and not get into some religious uh, dogmatic thinking. We need to understand God works in the ways he wants, especially when it comes to visions and dreams of the Old uh, Testament, where he, his hand was with people and his blessings was on them and his spirit worked in them for them to be able to interpret these things. Now, I'm going to share something with you before we go. And it's very similar to Daniel's uh, vision, which I didn't know at the time. This is something that happened to me on uh, July 29th. Uh, 2022. And I'm pulling from my notes. I had a dream that Jesus took me outside, out of my back door. And I looked up in the sky and I saw something that appeared to be words written, written in white clouds, like, like the clouds had shaped into really fine filament words but the words were really different i couldn't understand the language it was a blue sky out above the house and jesus is pointing and i look up and he says to me learn what this means i heard his words clearly and then i uh woke up and i wrote my notes down and so i went into retreat for a while. I had for like several days, I was trying to understand. I was trying, I was praying. What does this mean? What does this mean? So then what happened on uh, August 5th, I got my answer. I'd been praying. I didn't want to interpret it by uh, any other way. I just wanted an answer from him. And then early in the morning on 8-6-22, so, you know, from the night to the next morning, I heard his words. He said, this is the cost. This is the cost. And I woke up and I wrote it down. This is the cost. What does he mean? And then he gave me the revelation. Okay. When I repeated it, he was telling me this was... Uh, like Daniel's interpretation. You know, Daniel, where it says, mini, mini. It says in mini, mini, tekel umparshan, that the numbers, the numbers, the balance has been weighed in your, and you've been found lacking. And the prediction was in Daniel's time that the kingdom would fall. Well, then what God showed me was that the United States, okay, he began to unfold this. The United States has a a bad political relationship with each other you've got the right and the left they're always bickering they don't come together they are because of their dislike and uh, hate for one another they are dividing the kingdom that is supposed to be one one nation under god the right doesn't like the left the left doesn't like the right, nobody is focused on the Lord anymore. It's all about who can win, even if it means dragging the whole country down to hell with it. Okay? And he sees this. Now, in the ancient time, when Israel and Judah fought constantly, they were no longer under one king, King David or King Solomon. The kingdom was split, and they fought, and they fought, and they fought. And they had corrupted kings coming out of this. And what happened over time? God said, if you can't hold together the gift I've given you, 
that you are my people, both Judah and Israel. And if you continue bickering like this, I will remove you from my presence. And what happened? Babylon took them over. Okay. The 10 tribes were exiled. Judah became um, held by Babylon. Okay. And so we have to be careful as a nation. We need to come back indivisible under God. One nation under God, indivisible. But what we see nowadays is rather disgusting. And the, the cost, this is the cost. This is the cost. This is the cost. What is the cost? It's costing our country. God wants us united. He wants us to put our eyes back on him, to be humble and serviceful, to come back into relationship with him so he can pull things back together. Man cannot pull things together by himself, obviously. If we come back uh, under God, and not condemn each other, but come back and bless and bless and come and trust him wholeheartedly, this nation will hold together. And that's what the warning was that the Lord had told me back in 22. Now, I've had other dreams and visions. I don't want to go into prophecy right now, but I'll leave you with that. And then um, we need to pray for this country. We need to not look at politicians per se, or religious leaders, we need to look at God. We need to turn to him to move the hearts of the nations. We need to turn to him to open and close the hearts of rulers. That's what the Bible says he does. All right? We can't condemn each other. All right? Because we're lost without him. We need to pray and ask God to please bring peace and open the hearts of our leaders to love, and to work with one another. Okay. Now, I want to go into our prayer. How was that for a closure? Pretty intense. You can always work out good, remember, with God. He has a predestination for you in victory. He can do that for you. He can do it for many, and he can do it for our country. All right? So let's go into our prayer. I want to first thank you very much if I got your attention this far. You can contact me here at the email address here below. Um, email me, uh, give me feedback, inquiries, prayer requests. Please do. I'm always happy to pray for you and receive your emails. Thank you so much for what you have done so far in, in contacting me. Thank you. Now, also, um, I would like also, if this is interesting to you, to please like and subscribe, uh, support, follow, and share, and we can get this word out uh, to the world and continue to uh, praise the Lord and welcome in the kingdom of heaven. We are his tent pegs, and we look up and we know that the king is coming because he promised and he is moving his kingdom in our hearts to make ready. We are the tent pegs rolling out the red carpet for the king to come. Okay. Let's go into our prayer. Oh, by the way, after the prayer, we'll have us uh, some music and uh, some inspiring words to close out this video on a wonderful, happy note. Okay? Here's our prayer. Heavenly Father, glorious and holy are you, Father God. And Jesus, holy Son of God, who stepped down from glory to visit us among your creation. We acknowledge that you are our Lord and Savior, and you are one. Praise be to you, and bless you, Lord our God and Savior, Jesus. Lord, thank you for the dreams and visions you gave your prophets and your apostles so that we can learn and understand and see the power of your grace upon us. Thank you for your visions and dreams that you give us from your heavenly abode, so that we can have a clear vision of your hopes and aspirations and plans for us. Thank you for your mercy and protection that you gave us through your word, and thank you for the promises you also give us through your word, and visions and dreams, and that we are your children. We are your sons and daughters that are now on the earth, but also 
You hold a place for us in the kingdom of heaven to reign with your son. Okay, now we're moving into our petition. We ask that you help us to clear our minds and prepare our minds and hearts to receive the visions and dreams you have for us. We know that you have a great plan for us. Help us to receive what you have for us so that we can be guided by you through your word and understanding. You see to our comings and goings, and you also save us from disaster. You also give us visions and dreams to show us what is ahead, to warn us and to help us. Prepare us as you continue to unfold your plan across the earth and in the kingdom of heaven. We ask for discernment. One of the gifts of your Holy Spirit to help us understand with wisdom and knowledge the images and dreams and visions and the perception you want us to have so that we can follow your desires for us more closely. Mostly, we ask that these gifts are granted to draw us closer to you in love and in joy for you so that we can see what you see for us, to hear what you have to tell us so we can grow in our love for you and in our purpose on earth and in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now we're going to pause and resume when ready. I'd like you to uh, pray in your own tongue that you wish, your most holy voice, your most holy tongue. And um, this is a very um, personal part uh, of our prayer that you can fill in for yourself and you can resume when you are ready. Okay, all right, that was nice. Now, let's move into closure with thankfulness and acknowledgement. Thank you, Lord God, you know all things. You keep all your promises and you warn us and protect us throughout our life. We give you all the glory for your word, which we read about and also for what we receive in visions and dreams. Thank you for all the many ways you teach us and help us. You are our holy shepherd, and we receive you as ours, just as we are yours forever and ever. Blessings to you, Lord God and Jesus Christ, beloved, forever and ever. Amen. So thank you for joining me. Um, there's some music and scriptures to follow. I want to thank you, and I pray that you will get your own visions and dreams and the Lord will help you and guide you and see to your safety and enrich your life with his spirit. I want to thank you very much now. And shalom and God bless you in Christ Jesus. Bye for now.